<clears throat> so uh, let's get started. It's uh, nine o'clock. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Blockchain Connecting to the World International Webinar hosted by ABI Hyperledger and the Coin Telecom of China. I'm Yu Xiaoyu from CSCT, and I'm also the executive, executive chair of the International Working Group of ABI. Me and Tracy from CTC will moderate the webinar today, and the simultaneous interpretation services will be provided through the whole meeting. So please click the interpretation icon in the, uh, in the Zoom to choose language channel. For the panelists, please make sure that you are in the right language channel when you are giving your presentation. Well, blockchain has been a global hot topic for the recent years. The Chinese government also attaches great importance to blockchain technology, has launched a series of policies in order to encourage the development of blockchain industry. In terms of industry scale, China has more than 1,000 registered blockchain companies, and China is the second largest country in the global blockchain market. We think that it is our duty of ABI to better bridge in China's blockchain industry with the global one. So today, we, together with Hyperledger and the CTC, invited several Chinese and international experts to have an online webinar on the topic, China's blockchain industry embracing the world. And now I would like to introduce our distinguished guest today. We have Mr. Jin Jian and myself from uh, ABI, Mr. Brian uh, Ballendorf and uh, Mr. Julian Gordon from Hyperleisure, Ms. Tracy from CTC, Ms. Li Haihua from CICT, Mr. Jiang Xianghui from Anqin, Mr. Charles Dorsey from Consensus, Mr. Alan, uh, Alex Kogan from Leisure Domain, Mr. Guo Jiannan from Luchen, and Mr. Zhao Guang from Kledo. Here is our agenda for the webinar. We have three parts, opening speech, keynote speech, and the panel discussion. So let's move to the first part. Now we would like to hear the speech of uh, Dr. Jin Jian, Secretary General of ABI. Please, Dr. Jin. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Good morning. Hello,各位来宾,各位朋友们,大家好。我是来自中国信息通信研究院的金建。非常高兴能在这儿参加这个交流活动。今天我仅代表中关村区块链产业联盟和中国信息通信研究院对各位。对各位专家嘉宾的到来表示热烈的欢迎。中关村区块链产业联盟，啊，我们简称是ABI Alliance of Blockchain Industry，是由众多中国的高校、研究院、企业、自愿联合发起成立的非营利性社会组织，也是中国最早成立的区块链产业联盟。啊，ABI是2016年注册成立的。我们致力于推动于区块链为核心的新型基础设施建设。希望凝聚产业生态各方力量，促进区块链技术与经济社会的深度融合，培育壮大新产业、新模式、新业态，促进数字经济的繁荣发展，促进区块链产业的国际交流，是ABI非常重要的使命。2019年以来，区块链领域
、Coin Telegraph 以及国内外区块链龙头企业的众多业界大咖，为我们带来精彩的分享与讨论。在中国，很多人相信区块链不是一个风口，是一个时代，所以我们希望本次活动能够为国内外企业搭建国际交流平台，加深彼此的了解和认识。让更多的国外企业了解中国区块链发展，也为中国的企区块链企业国际化工作提供一个通道。同时，也非常欢迎与会的国内外企业加入中关村区块链产业联盟，共同见证参与中国区块链的发展。最后，希望各位多多关注中关村区块链产业联盟、Hyperledger 和 Coin Telegraph。预祝本次活动圆满成功！谢谢大家。And I guess that means a transition to me.、Uh, hello, everyone.、Uh, thank you、uh, for coming to our uh, uh, event. Um, I'm uh, sad that we couldn't all be gathering there in China to talk. By the way, I am Brian Bellendorf. I'm executive director of Hyperledger for the Linux Foundation.、Uh, I have made it a habit to travel to China. <laughs> About five times a year.、Uh, sadly, until last year, when obviously we were not able to. I was there last in January of last year,、um, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to start this travel again soon because、uh, the blockchain community in China and the Hyperledger community in particular in China are are on a rocket ship. It's been very exciting to watch、uh, uh, when I've come to visit, but also from the outside, the tremendous growth、uh, in blockchain technology in China,、um, both the、um, support. From the developers building the technologies, participating in the Hyperledger community, and、um, working for big companies sometimes, working for startups sometimes,、uh, but also the support from the top,、uh, from the very top, in fact, <laughs>、uh, for the, the adoption of this technology, which is really at its core about governance, really at its core about cooperation. Uh, really, at its core, about、uh, building the kinds of marketplaces and distributed systems that、uh, really can help lift all boats in a very、uh, communal kind of way. So,、uh, very exciting to see that adoption, and and I think it's exciting to see it done in a way that connects to the global industry as well. I think、uh, there have been a, no doubt a lot of pressures in the internet industry as a whole to focus on, you know, pulling back from internationalization, you know, to focus on data localization and sovereignty and、uh, setting up barriers uh, uh, to collaboration internationally.、Uh, and this is true、uh, across the board. And I believe the blockchain industry has been one to to be uh, uh, at the opposite of that, where it's been very much about collaborating across borders. And it's I think because the nature of the technology. Is such that it's very much about collaboration and very much about、uh, tracking transactions that happen across borders. A, a supply chain in diamonds or in rice or in、uh, computers or in any type of commodity starts in many different countries, and they come together and are assembled in other countries, often in China, and sometimes delivered to the China market, but also delivered internationally as well. And so, if you build a blockchain that tracks that movement, you're necessarily going to be、uh, tracking and involving companies from around the world, as well as regulators from around the world, as well as consumers from around the world. So, it's very important that we think of blockchain technology as a global technology, as a globalist technology. So, really exciting to see China embrace that. Exciting to see the growth in the rest of the world as well. But I think this is something that will help weave our societies together、uh, more closely, even when other forces. Forces try to pull us apart. No doubt, the strongest force in the last year globally、uh, has been COVID-19 and been、uh, this this health pandemic that we've all struggled to to counter. And it's in particularly this fight that we've seen blockchain technology really rise to prominence and、uh, be a part of real solutions. And whether it was supply chains in personal protective equipment、um, that helped new suppliers in、uh, China and other countries. Prove their creditworthiness, prove their trustworthiness、uh, to buyers around the world.、Um, something that would have been very difficult to do before,、uh, or it's using it in traceability around,、uh, say,、um, the pharmaceutical supply chains、uh, for vaccines,、uh, or it's really in, in this adoption that is starting to emerge around、um, verifiable credentials for the use of proving you've had the vaccine、uh, or have a positive test result. 
there are a lot of very promising projects and some that have already started to be deployed using blockchain technology, using hyperledger technology for that use case, but also laying the groundwork for distributed digital identity systems that can meet you know, country and national regulators requirements for verifiability and trustworthiness and, and all that, while also meeting up with the patient's rights when it comes to privacy and other consumer rights. So really interesting to watch that evolution driving even further adoption. Um, and then I think we're all about, you know, 10 years into uh, wondering what's going to happen with the cryptocurrency market. I think there's for good reason, a lot of hesitancy to uh, pursue that in depth, but uh, we've certainly seen a much more refined view of, you know, the world being split, not, not split between permissioned and permissionless blockchains, but actually a hybridization of the two starting to emerge. Uh, and I think uh, it's rightful to be very, very uh, cautious about the adoption of uh, permission, permissionless blockchain technology inside of enterprises and for government use cases. But we're seeing the world move very much in the direction of the adoption of these technologies. And I think reconciling with them is gonna be an important thing for all of us to do as a society. Um, so at Hyperledger, we're trying to be a bridge for a lot of this work. We're trying to help figure out- uh, how can we tame it to some degree? How can we make it uh, approachable for, by, by enterprises and by, by government types, but also create real value for citizens and for developers? And how in particular can we support the global community? We've done quite a bit with translation efforts. Uh, we've, we have a very active China technical working group co-chaired by Jay Guo, who I see here. Uh, good to see you, Jay. Um, I, and, and really are very keen within Hyperledger to, to, to build these bridges. And that's why we felt it was important to bring so many of our partners and other companies uh, in the blockchain industry from outside China to this convening and to start this conversation. Um, so I, I'll, I'll pass the baton now. I'm really excited about what we can do and uh, uh, let's get started. Yeah, thank you, Brian, for your uh, very exciting speech and thank you, uh, thank the Hyperledger for bridging the, bridging the China's blockchain industry and uh, the global one. So uh, now before we move to the keynote speech part, I would like to ask all of the audiences to turn on your cameras uh, because we don't have physical contact. We, ha uh, we think it's better to have a, a screenshot. So please uh, turn on your cameras. Thank you. My colleague will do the screenshot. You have to stop presenting the slides. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Your smile. <laughs> <laughs> right, please. Cheers. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let's move on. Uh, no, I will really do the. Uh, so in the keynote speech part, we will have five speakers. So as time is limited, so please pay attention to the time. Well, firstly, I will give the floor to uh, Mr. Julian Golden from Hyperledger, please, and you can share your screen now. All right, so shall I just start presenting my slides? Yes, yes, please. All right, next up. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, and we can see the slides. Clear. Okay, so I think we've lost the moderator, so we're self-moderating. So uh, I'd like to say uh, thank you. Uh, firstly, I'm Julian Gordon. I'm the VP for Asia Pacific for Hyperledger. And uh, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, our Hyperledger associate member, ABI, which is the Alliance of Blockchain Industries, ZPARP, for inviting us here today and making this event possible. Thank you for your contribution and your collaboration uh, and for being a bridge, one of the bridges into China. I'm gonna to talk to you today uh, in my 10 minutes about how Hyperledger and blockchain technologies are being embraced and help transforming how businesses work here uh, in China, APAC and globally. We're streamlining business processes, improving efficiencies, cutting costs, building trust, 
and preventing error and fraud across an increasing array of different industries. And I'll share with you businesses and governments around the world recognize the importance to industry and society of the role of blockchain technology and how it can you know, play in how the world works. And I think as Brian said, I think a key thing we're seeing today is even this pandemic, uh, blockchain is taking an important component. Um, and I'll particularly look at the, the role that China has make, is making uh, this has happened and how they're embracing uh, the world. So it wasn't long ago uh, that uh, President Xi of China made a very important uh, talk on the importance, not only for China uh, to embrace blockchain technology, but also for this technology to play a role in bringing a more fair and more predictable, more multilateral type of deployment of technology to the business systems of the world. It's been very impressive uh, to watch China's adoption of this technology, and I've been, I've been very close to it, and uh, you know, it's, been, it's been wonderful. And I believe that it's thanks to the entrepreneurial uh, spirit, and smart engineers and business uh, engine, uh, owners working together here in technology, uh, here in China, and also the leadership from the top and the prioritization that has been placed uh, on this technology. Uh, we have seen amazing growth uh, here in China and uh, some wonderful uh, implementations of blockchain so uh, and it is a very important part of our ecosystem so let's have a quick look uh, where we are uh, today at Hyperledger what has been the momentum well we are five years in and I think Brian it must be about five years ago that you first came to China uh, with, with about Hyperledger uh, we've got 16 different code bases uh, we are global 20% of our members are here in China, and actually 15% of our contributors are here, very, very important component. And we are just growing, growing, growing. Um, what have we done in those, uh, those, those uh, five years? Well, this is what Hyperledger is about, about creating code bases. We have now five, 15 uh, or 16 different code bases and a very large uh, portfolio of, of, of uh, projects in our labs. I'm just going to pick out three kind of trends because I've been asked to look at trends, but really let's take out first Hyperledger Fabric, which uh, according to the CAICT study, over 60% uh, of the projects it was looking at were running Hyperledger Fabric here in China. Um, and I can share that statistic uh, globally. It is very, very strong in the permission place and it's just growing momentum. Uh, so that's Fabric. And we're going to hear a little bit about some of the uh, solutions today running on Fabric. Another area has been uh, over the last few years is our move to work closely with the Ethereum, especially the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Uh, and that uh, we're gonna hear today, I'm not gonna, Charles is gonna talk about Bezu uh, and what we're doing with Bezu, which is a Java-based Ethereum client. Um, but that really has meant that our whole portfolio of different uh, projects goes from uh, highly permissioned all the way through to potentially the use of the mainnet. And the third area that I'd like to look at and we're going to share a little bit today is around self-sovereign identity or uh, uh, VCs or verifiable credentials, not uh, venture capitalists, verifiable credentials, VCs, uh, and uh, and role that some of that has taken in medicine. And we're gonna see uh, um, uh, uh, Alex talk about that uh, from what Domain Ledger have been doing in the medical field. And obviously that includes uh, Aries and other projects. And there are many other projects. I, I really recommend that you have a look at these. Many of these uh, have contributors here in China and have a vibrant community here in China. Uh, also, um, with, as the theme here, embracing uh, uh, you know, the world, embracing technology here in China, uh, you can see that Fabric is pretty well on all the major clouds and including, uh, and financial, which you're gonna hear about today. Uh, you know, we've got BSN, uh, we have uh, JD, uh, we have uh, all the different Tencent cloud, all the key uh, China clouds. So we are seeing that very vibrant community here and the use of a lot of hyperledger technologies and also uh, that contribution back. Uh, this is a, a uh, the Forbes uh, do a study once a year uh, and it came out again in 2021. Uh, uh, this year we, and it shows 60% of the blockchain uh, companies uh, using, are using Hyperledger. Um, and I'd like to just pick out a few things. Uh, what the first uh, uh, one three years ago had one China company, which is Ant Financial. Now we have China Construction Bank and the China Construction Bank, you know, famous for their uh, uh, over, doing over $50 billion of extended letters of credit on their systems. Uh, we also have Tencent. Uh, we also have other China members there, including ICBC, who are there for the first time. Uh, and this is just 
the tip of the iceberg when it comes uh, to uh, the technology. And it just shows the array of different, uh, from BHP and mining uh, to Maersk, who are, who are with uh, uh, Trade Lens are doing a, a 50 cent of the world's uh, um, containers uh, involved in there. I think 137 different companies. Uh, they've done 1.6 billion different uh, shipping transactions. Just some very, very large implementations. Uh, in China, uh, we have, as we always have, and I thank uh, these companies uh, in this community here who are part of uh, the, uh, the global, very much part of the global community. And uh, I, I'm not going to go through them today because we have limited time, but I said we're going to hear from Ant Financial today. We have the large companies like the Huawei's, the Baidu's, the JD's. We have also lots of great uh, smaller startups uh, and mid-sized companies like uh, Bone Chain, Fusion Tech, uh, Ziggurat. Um, and at least recently we've had BSN. Uh, who have joined us as well, and a plethora of different universities. Now, the trend that we kind of always uh, wanted to, to start is, is, is the importance of community. Uh, Hyperledger is all about community. And right from the beginning, uh, through the kind of guidance of the way that Brian uh, and the Lentz Foundation runs these projects, uh, is that we've always wanted to make sure this is inclusive and global. And China has been a very important part of that. And I think a lot of that has been down to the success of our our technical working group here in China. Um, these are the, uh, the, the, the co-leads. You're going to hear from Jay. He's going to be on the uh, panel later on. Uh, but we have David down here in Hong Kong and Yang Chang, who's uh, at CIACT also. All very, very much helping drive uh, education uh, and uh, the community and actually even writing code bases now uh, here in China. So a very, very exciting uh, things that are going on there. Uh, we have translation. Uh, translation, I'd just like to point out, started in China. Uh, this is a trend that is growing and growing. Uh, we uh, want to reach the billions of people out there who don't ha necessarily uh, have access, uh, ability to, to, to read English. And we have now Portuguese, Japanese, Malayan, Spanish, Russian, Tamil, and French. This is run by a global team, but I really thank uh, the, the TWGC uh, and people here in China, translating it both ways, stuff from China into English and English to China, making sure uh, that we are a truly global community. Uh, so I, I thank the, the community there. Uh, also, uh, we have had, and I think this is a story worth telling, when the pandemic happened, uh, the China community got together. It realized we weren't going to have our, you know, our regular meetups. So we put together, or I say we, the China Technical Working Group, with our, with our staff, put together 28 webinars in 28 weeks. So even during lockdowns, pandemics, we were able to communicate and bring, take the technology forward. And now it's on, on our, our QQ 10 cent video. You can see over 9,000 um, views of it. And uh, please do have a look. And we're continuing this program in different ways uh, you know, in terms of our very vibrant community here. Now I'm gonna finish uh, with a little bit about uh, some of the key things that, that we think uh, make uh, these communities uh, important. Uh, really, it's about training and, and certification uh, are very key. It's always important for a community, especially a community that is developing um, blockchain uh, or technology, open source technology that is meant to be at the highest quality. Uh, this is going to be running businesses. It's going to be running uh, 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 governments, uh, many different systems. So it's all about enterprise grade. So we do have training. Uh, these are, these are, we have professional training, which you can take part in. And we do uh, have partners who are working with us in China on, on this in terms of uh, Hyperledger uh, certification, uh, Hyperledger administrator, and uh, the uh, and other uh, training tools, uh, please do uh, uh, get uh, involved uh, in this. We also provide free courses. Uh, with those are predominantly in English. Uh, we have these EDX courses, EDX Org, which has a, a large number of different courses that we have. Uh, we've had over two hundred thousand individual take those free courses. And I'd like to add today, uh, literally last week that the Technical Working Group of China are working on a, on, and they're looking for volunteers or people to help. They are working on a training for Hyperledger Fabric in Chinese. The first one went on Tencent videos and other social media uh, uh, channels within China. So we're providing that and the community providing more and more access uh, for people uh, to have a training. So that, that is a very strong training. And I think China is embracing that and uh, very much so and understands and, and, uh, and, and does that. Um, and I'm gonna finally, uh, uh, leave with uh, 
our enterprise uh, grade global ecosystems. I said it's important if we are uh, as an open source software or any type of software and what has been the success of Linux Foundation projects is creating uh, a level of expertise and professionalism that can support build service uh, uh, blockchain networks. So we have uh, launched last year the Hyperledger Certified Service Provider, uh, which is a list uh, of service providers that have reached that grade. Uh, that grade is, is, uh, is, is by being, uh, uh, having a certain number of your staff trained at a certain level uh, in terms of certification. Uh, and I'd like to point out of the 23 that we have now globally, uh, I think eight of those or seven or eight of those are in China uh, and about five of those or six of those are in the rest of Asia. So we are seeing a uh, great uh, contribution here and uh, a great expertise here in China. And uh, I like to reiterate, uh, it's all about embracing the globe, embracing uh, blockchain. And, uh, and that's what we're, we, we see here in China and across Asia Pacific. So with that, uh, with my 10 minutes, I'd like to pass it back uh, to uh, uh, pass it back to you there, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Julian, for your excellent presentation about Hyperledger. Well, Hyperledger is one of the most successful open source blockchain community. And in China, a large number of blockchain enterprises are using uh, Hyperledger Fabric to build their business. So um, I think Hyperledger has been playing and will play a key role in the globalization of China's blockchain industry. Uh, and uh, also we have uh, noticed that the TWGC has done a, a lot of work so we also invited uh, TWGC Chair Guo Jianlan to join us. Uh, and we look forward to your ideas in the panel discussion. Thank you. And uh, now I will give the floor to uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Li Haiwa from CICT, please. please. It's my honor to be here today. Thank you for having me. So based on what Julian just said, I'd like to give you a brief introduction of what we are doing here at CAICT. And my topic today is the introduction of blockchain and the DeFi infrastructure, which is BIF. So today, I'll be talking about these five things. Why is blockchain infrastructure important in China's policies? Also, this concept of BIF, I'll be talking about the ecosystem of BIF and our international cooperation. As Julian has just said, now ICT and digital economy Models. So what we are doing is that we look at this digital economy in four perspectives, including digital industrialization and industrial digitization, digital governance, and something new, which is data valuation. So, Whatever the aspect is about, it's all about increasing mass production in the industrial age. So looking forward, we believe there will be a transaction explosion. The transactions will be faster and more frequent and will make transactions private and fair. A important foundation of that is blockchain technology. China attaches great importance to the development of blockchain technology. Just recently, in our 14th five-year plan, the plan has included blockchain as one of the key industries that the country will focus on. In addition, 
还有这个部委层面，另外在地方政府这块呢， the central government 也是非常关注区块链发展，出台了很多的政策。All pay great attention to the development of blockchain. 那基于这种背景的话，我们也是推出了区块链网，呃，新兴基础设施的建设。And based on that context, now we have BIF. 其中，其中的话呢，除了区块链，这个优点就不说了，有共识啊 ，P2P 网络呀，智能等等啊，区块链的技术。We have consensus. System, a P2P network, smart contract, and other things. Uh, we can achieve the end-to-end -end trading, the peer-to-peer payments, collaboratives, and other models. A one important feature is that we are cooperating with the government. Uh, uh, you, you know that identifier is a very uh, important one. You know our ID card is a kind of identifier. And so uh, we hope to build a new kind of identifier, uh, which can make a connection between our own identity and our data. This can provide us and our enterprises an opportunity of connection, and our identifier is really significant in that sense. We have also noticed that the International Society is paying special attention to the identifier-related technology. That's why we have created the BIF. We want to combine a blockchain and identifier. That's why our name is Blockchain Identifier Infrastructure. And our goal is to promote the innovation of technology in this field. Our core concept is, to, uh, is that we want to build a new kind of infrastructure which can integrate the blockchain technology and promote the transition, the safe transition of data. It is also a very important part of the current internet development. A uh, lot of data has been created in our using the internet process. So uh, we want to use the BIF to promote the uh, transition of our real economy into the digital economy. In terms of the architecture of BIF, uh, our technology is based on the permission public blockchain and uh, the identifier management system and other interoperable service technology. We have uh, two parts. The first part is the main chain. Uh, we will provide some public data. Uh, some resolution service and other kind of resources. Uh, we also have another chain which will provide us with uh, other services. Here we can see uh, the backbone, the backbone node will serve uh, for the connection of our main chain and the other chain. And also we can see that we have integrated uh, the three level user and account system. We hope that through this kind of design and through this kind of architecture, we can achieve the interoperability of all levels. And uh, uh, we can also provide the sources of assets and public services and all kinds of permissions needed. Here are the features of BIF. First of all, it is a public chain and also permission blockchain. It is the uh, kind of combination of these two. Because for the pub public blockchain, we have the feature of open and flexible, and for permission blockchain, we have controllable and restricted features. So we want to combine these two. Uh, we have another feature that is uh, we kind of have a blockchain of uh, isomorphic and heterogeneous blockchain. And also we have the hybrid consensus mechanism. And also we have distributed storage scheme. Uh, we support the cross-platform data reading and writing. On um, uh, our platform. 
And also we have the pluggable smart contract engine and the credible guarantee. And these are closely connected to our identifier technology. Uh, the ecosystem of BIF, you can see it on the model on our screen. Uh, it can be divided into uh, technical components, uh, the, the technical expansion, innovative applications, and public services. For the, uh, for the first two layers, we have some fundamental technology, and for the components and technical extension layer, we have other protocols. And for the innovation and the public layer, we have the uh, like the industrial internet and other association and other aspects. Uh, you can see on the right side of our screen, we have the super node, which uh, features the uh, technical and service partner and the backbone node, and also application and the uh, eco service provided. Here you can see the events and timeline for BIF deployment in China. Here you can see uh, we have a briefing of what we have done. We were initiated uh, August last year. Now in Beijing, Chongqing. Uh, uh, we have already signed the Supernode program contract. And now we are also building in Kunshan and Yinkou the backbone node construction contract. We are also trying to uh, be integrated and connected to the current existing blockchains like the Unicom chain and the Sichuan chain and also other chains. They have already gained their access to our BIF. So you can see this is a comprehensive system. And in this whole process, ABI has played an important role. Here you can see in the middle of the slide, you can see the organization framework of ABI. We have a group, an international group, and our group is responsible for international cooperation. We hope in the future this can be a platform for our international communication. We also want to uh, organize some activities like the uh, meeting for our partners, and uh, we hope these meetings can be the platform for all developers to share their ideas and to make innovations. In the future, we also make free use of the BIF architecture innovation committee, and we, also, we will also have some reports provided to our partners. Uh, we will also work with the local governments to promote the deployment of blockchain. The international actions are a very important part of our future plan. Uh, we hope to work with organizations, industrial alliance, universities, and enterprises in the future. Uh, we have already signed MOU with Hyperledger and uh, in uh, our partner's introduction, you may find that we have quite solid foundation for future cooperation. We hope to make full use of the current technologies and to promote the development of blockchain in the future. This is my brief introduction. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Uh, Lee, for Mrs. your wonderful for presentation your about the overall. Uh, please mute. Uh, overall introduction of uh, China's blockchain industry and a very attractive blockchain project, BIF. As we can see that BIF is developing very fast in China, and I also know that BIF is looking for international partners. So if you are interested, please contact us. Thank you. Uh, uh, I would remind the uh, following uh, speakers, uh, please, because we have interpreter here, uh, so you need to uh, choose the interpret, uh, interpretation channel uh, you want to speak, and uh, then uh, you can uh, show your slides.
Now I will give the floor to Mr. Charles Dorsey from Consensus. Charles, please. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Let me share my slide here just briefly. Thank you. Uh, so my name is uh, Charles Dorsey. I'm the director of Consensus here in Asia Pacific. I'm the Consensus offices in, uh, in, APAC, uh, in APAC out of Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Australia, and Japan. Um, and today I will uh, emphasize on how we use that consensus together with the community, um, Hyperledger Bezu. Uh, so a few words about consensus. Consensus has three main, uh, I would say, partners and, and communities, uh, circles we are uh, interacting with. The first one is uh, uh, the developer community. Uh, we are the, uh, the editor of uh, Truffle, uh, a software downloaded more than 4.5 million times to help uh, developers uh, develop their smart contracts uh, on, on Solidity. Uh, we are also uh, offering security services with consensus diligence, which is offering services uh, to many different projects. Uh, Infura helps with connectivity to the mainnet. Uh, Codify has been tokenizing a large number of assets. Uh, and we are also uh, the developers of uh, Metamask, which uh, if you interact with uh, uh, the Ethereum blockchain, uh, you, may, you might be familiar with. Today, we, uh, we, we see a very strong, uh, I would say, uh, expansion of one topic, which is a very hot topic and which uh, China is obviously leading. Uh, the topic is uh, central bank digital currencies uh, and consensus has been involved with this topic for, uh, for quite some time back in 2018 with the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the Reserve Bank of Australia. And today we are working with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority uh, on CBDCs, and I will come back to this uh, to this project uh, a little bit later. Uh, so I would like to, to share with you some of the notable projects uh, where we see the China uh, China blockchain industry uh, integrating and collaborating uh, with the international community uh, using uh, using uh, Hyperledger Bezu, which is really the, the focus of uh, of consensus. One of these projects is uh, the project uh, lead now by uh, BIS, Bank of International Settlement. This project is called uh, MCBDC Bridge. And uh, what MCBDC Bridge is essentially a multiple CBDC cross-border project uh, involving uh, the Bank of Thailand, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, the Central Bank of the UAE, as well as the Digital, um, uh, the digital Currency Institute from the People's Bank of China. So this project is undergoing. Uh, there is a video which uh, I'm very happy to, to share with you, or maybe you can find it online also, uh, which is explaining uh, what, is, uh, uh, what is really the, the project about and what it brings together and how this blockchain technology is embraced uh, by the international community, uh, but also obviously by, uh, by the Chinese, uh, the Chinese uh, regulators looking at how uh, the currencies and the, the commerce between different regions uh, can be enabled and facilitated uh, by blockchain. Uh, so that's uh, that's a very important uh, topic uh, where we are developing a very complex um, uh, financial mechanism which are powered by. We are developing a very complex financial mechanism which are powered by. We are developing a 呃，很多的亚。Another project which was mentioned earlier is BSN. For us at Consensus, BSN is a way for to connect with a wider China ecosystem. It's also, I think, a great opportunity for the Chinese blockchain ecosystem to connect also with with the international market. And uh, we see a very strong traction over there. And uh, blockchain being a collaboration technology, it's really, uh, it's really important to see that uh, the, the technology is leveraged uh, by all players of all sizes uh, and uh, essentially building bridges between all these different businesses and industries. Hyperledger Bezu is uh, the Ethereum client we are focusing on. Uh, it's a, a very interesting client, uh, allowing uh, practitioners to deploy uh, private chains, but also public chains. Uh, so it's really sitting in many different type of uh, of uh, environment and, and use cases, uh, and it's really uh, it really offers also a very advanced permissioning capabilities, as well as some uh, some of the off-chain privacy features uh, you you would uh, you would expect. 
So if you're looking at, at growing your permission chain uh, with additional features or, or building a new permission chain uh, with, uh, with a Java-based uh, type of, uh, of client, um, please be in touch with the Hyperledger uh, Foundation, uh, be in touch with Consensus. Uh, there is a very interesting stack which is getting very strong, uh, very strong uh, tractions right now. And if you look at the different levels of the technology and, and where, where Hyperledger Bezu sits, it's really at this enterprise level uh, type of, uh, of stack uh, and layer, uh, looking at how you can uh, essentially uh, store your data, how you can uh, execute your different operations uh, via the EVM and also uh, deploying different type of consensus system, uh, but without uh, uh, making any concessions uh, on the privacy uh, performance uh, or permissioning as well. So it really sits uh, very elegantly uh, and supports all the applications and the different tooling you want to build on the top of it. So I really invite everyone to, um, to deep dive and join uh, this, uh, this project of Hyperledger. Uh, and the, the vibrant community of, uh, of Hyperledger Bezu. Let's have a quick look at the, the focus of, uh, of enterprise use case. Uh, Consensus is a global player. Uh, we are one of the largest uh, blockchain engineering company. Uh, we operate in, uh, in more than 30 countries. And uh, what we see today is a very strong demand, as you all know, in, uh, in the global trade uh, type of use cases. Uh, but we see also a very strong momentum in growth in terms of uh, asset management, institutional capital market, and obviously with CBDCs and stable coin uh, type of topics, uh, the payment and, uh, uh, and, and the management of money in general uh, is also a really a, a very strong uh, emerging demand uh, for the technology itself. Some of the use cases built on Hyperledger Bezu, uh, one of them is a, a project called uh, Comgo. So Comgo is a consortium uh, bringing together more than 15 uh, different uh, players from the commodity and trade finance sector, focusing on the oil business. Um, and this platform has been really helping uh, all the different players which are managing their trade, financing their trade, uh, to reduce the time of processing of letter of credits uh, and, uh, and managing uh, 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 about one, mil 1 billion US dollar of, uh, of transactions today on, uh, on the Comgo platform. Another one which is in my opinion, a very, a very strong use case and a very good illustration of how the blockchain industry in China is building bridges uh, in a very natural way. Um, this project is called Coventis. Uh, it's a project which has been uh, built and designed by Consensus for this consortium of uh, major uh, industry leaders uh, in the world of uh, agricultural uh, commodities. So think of wheat, uh, think of... 比如说国际的糖的交易啊，等等，你可以看到，现在已经有六个农业的头部企业支持我们了。我们就是来帮助这些企业，让他们增进他们的效率，可以让他们更好的在整个的供应链当中去提升速度。At the, at, the, at the blockchain technology to build these bridges and facilitate and accelerate uh, their, uh, their business growth. So what we see in terms of, uh, of use cases, uh, and I think this is uh, some, some, uh, some uh, very uh, positive uh, food for thought uh, for the attendees and, 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 uh, and the China and international community, uh, there is a very strong use, uh, use case right now around programmable assets. So think of the cash with CBDCs, but think also of some, some assets which you can uh, bring from the physical world into, into blockchain systems. Another use case, obviously, and this is one of them, is illustrated via Comgo or, or Coventis, is uh, how you can compress workflows. And uh, if you put this into the context of uh, global Chinese companies, uh, the more global you are, the more complex uh, and, uh, and, uh, and technical are your workflows. So that's where really um, Hyperledger Bezu brings um, immediate value in, uh, in helping with uh, all the document workflows or, or, or post-trade uh, post, uh, security settlement. And there is also another use case, which is growing very strongly, especially here in Hong Kong uh, and in Greater China in general, is the tokenization of uh, investment products. Uh, so we see regulators starting to uh, uh, release licenses for this type of asset. So uh, the regulations is coming and this is really calling a, a very strong pull from the market. 
around really uh, building digitally native uh, financial products uh, in order to again facilitate financial workflows and uh, and uh, and bring the more liquidity and, uh, and and more velocity to to the assets. So thank you so much for uh, for your your attention today. Uh, you can follow consensus on WeChat, and uh, if you have uh, an interest in the Hong Kong. Um, uh, blockchain ecosystem, uh, I invite you to, to consider uh, reading a book which uh, I've wrote and which will be going out in a, in a few days. Uh, this book is called Block Kong and it's uh, 21 interviews about 21 blockchain entrepreneurs um, in, uh, in the city uh, and it will give you a flavor of uh, uh, the ecosystem and how people are, are organizing, what kind of business they are building. So it's, uh, it's a fun read. Uh, all the interviews are done around breakfast, and uh, of course, uh, Julian from My Ledger is uh, is one of these uh, VIP guests. Uh, so I really invite you to to consider this read, uh, and all the proceeds from the the book sales uh, will be going to uh, training uh, to Hong Kong uh, students in need uh, in order for these computer science students from Hong Kong to upskill themselves and help them to start their career in the in the blockchain industry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Charles, for the introduction of what uh, Consensus has been doing. And we all know that Consensus is a very prestigious enterprises, uh, enterprise, and I hope there will be more and more cooperation with uh, Chinese uh, projects in the future. And we sincerely uh, invite Consensus to be a member of ABI in order to better connect to China's blockchain industry. Thank you. Uh, and now I will give the floor to Mr. Jiang Xianghui from Anqin. Mr. Jiang, please. Uh, sorry, you, you didn't turn on your uh, microphone. Oh, uh, can, you, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, just a moment, I get uh, stuck on the technical issue. Uh, I, some kind of you losing you? I'm sorry, we wait a few seconds. Uh, maybe uh, Mr. Jiang has some uh, uh, connection problem, I think. Uh, you want to switch to Alex? Yes, Alex. yes. Uh, uh, Alex, are, are you ready for the presentation? Uh, so, sorry, I, I cannot hear you. Sorry. Oh, testing, there we go. I was uh, hardware muted. Can you hear me okay? Yes, but it's uh, not very clear. So How about now? Uh, yes, it's, it's better. It's <laughs> so much better. So I will give the floor to uh, Mr. Alex uh, Corbin from uh, Ledger Domain, please. Wonderful. Uh, I'm going to uh, share. Here we go. Can you see all right? Yeah, we can see. So can good. All right. Um, so very briefly, um, as mentioned earlier, I'm Alex Colgan, uh, head of uh, marketing and uh, partnerships at Ledger Domain. Um, thank you again for having me here today. Um, while most of our efforts at Ledger Domain have been uh, within the uh, US and uh, European markets, uh, I'm excited to share some updates on efforts and findings that we've made that uh, have sort of more broad uh, global implications. And uh, so today I'm going to focus very specifically on uh, the uh, role of blockchain within global drug supply assurance. So very briefly, um, healthcare has a number of uh, unique challenges, um, you know, having to do with, you know, rising tide of privacy and data protection laws, 
we're seeing uh, you know many different regulatory regimes, uh, role-based privileges within and beyond national boundaries, and uh, the pro the challenges of uh, credentialing, as Julian uh, called out at the beginning. Um, blockchain is uniquely suited to address some of these challenges because it does enable uh, a tamper-proof, time-stamped, auditable record of transactions, a single version of the truth. Um, our work has been focused uh, primarily around the use of decentralized technologies like blockchain uh, in order to address some of these uh, safety and privacy concerns. Um, the biggest challenge within pharma supply chain is that we have a lot of these uh, unique assets moving through the chain um, drug packages. And uh, the way that uh, transaction information is being handled currently is that uh, you know, every one of the large enterprises, the drug manufacturers, the wholesalers, um, moving the drugs uh, around the supply chain, each have their own system of record. Oftentimes these uh, systems of record do not match up. And uh, that makes it increasingly difficult to mitigate everything from drug shortages to uh, implementing recalls to being able to uh, you know, identify uh, where tainted or counterfeit drugs may be coming from. Uh, in all of these cases, um, you know, ultimately endangering patient outcomes. So, we wanted to focus on how we could uh, address some of these challenges and uh, ultimately ended up uh, tying into a specific piece of regulation within the US market known as the Drug Supply Chain Security Act. Um, this is a US federal law. Uh, it requires an interoperable system to track pr all prescription drugs uh, through the United States by 2023. Um, there were a few components of how this was rolled out within the United States that were um, very useful in terms of us being able to tie in directly and really unlock some value through a shared uh, blockchain for uh, pharma supply chain trading partners. One of them is that uh, under the law of prescription, drugs are required to have standardized, unique identifiers in the form of 2D barcodes. Blockchain is very, very good at tracking unique assets. It is not especially good at tracking, um, you know, sort of generic assets that are interchangeable with each other. With this uh, standardized, unique identifier model, that is uh, imposed under law in the, in the United States, um, you know, now we have unique assets in the form of lowest saleable units uh, within the US market. The越来越多企业都在使用这个标准，我们发现通过这样的一个标识符呢，就可以让我们去建立通用的数据模型，从而让我们来处理这些信息。也就是说，在某一个特定时刻、某一个最小销售单元，只有一个人可以去获得它。
provided a very pressing uh, top-down regulatory need uh, that blockchain uh, is sort of uniquely uh, well-suited to address. So back in 2019, uh, we undertook a uh, case study uh, with the US FDA and UCLA Health. Uh, we focused in specifically on uh, the implications of what this interoperable system would look like. Uh, we deployed and tested uh, with Biogen and UCLA Health a uh, tracking system backed by blockchain that was able to uh, track a specific drug at UCLA. In this case, the drug was a drug called Spinraza. It's $125,000 per dose. Uh, the uh, pharmacists at UCLA were obviously very concerned with tracking where it was and where it was going at all times and uh, verifying it with the original manufacturer because in this case uh, a, a counterfeit could have you know devastating consequences for the patients uh, in this case infants um, so more recently uh, we have moved on to the sort of next natural phase uh, tying into this um, sort of know your customer requirement imposed by the DSASA. The, the fact that you have to interoperate with uh, trading partners who you actually have no business relationship with. So we have um, been undertaking a blockchain pilot, uh, which is you know, now moving into production. Uh, we did a study peer review uh, published in the peer review journal Blockchain and Healthcare Today. Uh, with Genentech, Sanofi, Amgen, and of course UCLA Health, uh, focusing on a blockchain-backed uh, decentralized identifier network. Um, so here is you know, very briefly uh, just the architecture of that. I'll drop a link to the uh, to the paper uh, in the comments, but I wanted to really dig into what this looks like at a global level because. Um, while we have been focusing on building out this network effect within the uh, U.S. pharma supply chain, obviously uh, I, the notion of a global healthcare verifiable credential has, you know, much broader implications. And being able to back uh, a, a single version of the truth within the U.S. supply chain can be broadened out and uh, encompass. Uh, stakeholders from around the world. Within the healthcare space specifically, um, you know, we see the challenges of connecting to legacy systems, uh, blocking and remedying bad transactions, uh, machine learning. You see here that we have these three planes. The transaction plane is where the vast majority of uh, activity would be taking place. These are regular drug transactions. Anytime you get um, sort of negative outcomes, what they call in the pharmaceutical industry, the sad path, uh, you would escalate to a control plane. That's where you see dashboards. That's where you see analytics being come to, come to bear. If things get escalated from that point, if you know, there's, it's not just that a drug is expired, but it's actually that it's counterfeit, then it escalates to uh, you know, regulatory action. Ultimately, where we're seeing this moving is that um, you know, chain code portability, blockchain federations and integrability are on the rise. Hyperledger uh, and its affiliated projects have evolved massively uh, just over the past year. A lot of the problems that we initially found that we had to uh, you know, solve by uh, developing workarounds on our own have been uh, addressed by the main projects themselves. We're seeing uh, more robust models and standards for organizations and permissions. We're seeing analytics on chain data, uh, which is uh, you know, really compelling. And uh, we're seeing integration with enterprise systems such as ERP and MES. Uh, ultimately, we're looking towards a future where decentralized technologies, artificial intelligence, and IoT uh, combine to make every transaction instantaneous, confidential, unforgeable, and ultimately auditable.
Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, for the introduction of uh, the project that uh, uh, Leisure Domain is doing. Well, the, combin uh, the combining of blockchain and the verifiable credentials with uh, drug supply chain and other industries uh, is uh, of great importance. And uh, uh, this year, the G20 also raised the topic of blockchain for traceability. Uh, well, in China, uh, CICT is uh, doing a lot of work on IoT identifiers and uh, the BIF project uh, just, uh, just now, uh, Mrs. Li Hanhua has just uh, done the presentation, is uh, combining the uh, identifiers with blockchain. So maybe we have a lot to discuss in the future. Absolutely. Uh, IoT really is the missing piece of this puzzle. And uh, I'm really excited to hear uh, just how much progress has been made. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Yeah, we will get, uh, get in touch uh, after the seminar. Uh, uh, and uh, also, we will welcome you to be a part, uh, to be a member of the ABI if you want to uh, know more about China's blockchain industry. Thank you. And I see uh, that uh, Mr. Jiang has uh, connected, reconnected. Yeah, finally, it's, uh, it's it's good. I got some technical yes. issue. Now it should be working. Huh? Yes. So I will give the floor to Mr. Jiang Xianhui from Anchen. Please, Mr. Jiang. Yeah, uh, just one moment. Okay, now it works. Sorry, just, yeah. Okay, um, I'm sp switch back to Chinese. Um, um, Good morning, everyone. I'm very glad to take this opportunity to take part in the activity today. Today, I'm going to make a presentation based on our experience at, at Anqing. But first of all, about Anqing, uh, we believe that the positioning of blockchain is not just about IT or IT-related technology. We also believe it is closely related to the chain-up industries. That我们不仅仅是做这个一个数字化 呃，我们阿里巴巴有句土话叫这个，因为相信，所有看见。啊，然后呢，这个believing and chain will grow exponentially. It will be the scale of ten Alipay. And so, infrastructure，呃，我们其实做了大量的这些工作，包括bus的platform，包括这个多元的这个多个这个multi-party的这个communication，包括这些这个一些一些技术。包括我们有非常成熟的一些跨链的一些技术我们也非常愿意和这个做区块链的一些一些企业一些联盟啊新生这个大量的一些这个这个区块链的跨链的融合从区块链的应用的角度来说呢我们其实简单来说我们可以分
就这个 Blockchain Plus， 因为我们是觉得是说光纯粹的区块链呢 ，Blockchain 呢，我们是觉得它的那个价值啊比较单薄。Uh, Blockchain technology itself. Uh, 区块链可能 plus 这个 IOT 才能真正在很多的一些业务上面能给处理。因为我在 Blockchain 上面的这个数据是真实的，但是呢，我在 physical 的这是在一个实际的世界上，我这数据要是不真实的话，那其实 Blockchain 上面没有任何意义。啊、uh, ，只有 Blockchain plus， 比如说 IOT。同时，我们也做了大量尝试，包括 Blockchain plus 这个 AI。啊、uh, ，blockchain plus 这个可能的这个汽车 plus 其他的一些 industry， 这样的话我们才能变成一个数字化的一个真正的一个赋能者。那这里面其实列举了我们一些一些 case 啊，我就不详细讲了。我目前来说，我们有五十多个 scenario 真正的已经在商业化了啊，那然后给客客户提供服务。从目前角度来说呢，我们在技术上面的投入其实特别大。大家其实可以看到，从技术上面的角度来说，我们在这个呃区块链的这个专利数，特别是授权数层这个层面，在这个行业上遥遥领先啊、呃。我们做了大量的一些投入，呃，我相信在至少在中国这个区域，呃，这个这个蚂蚁链的这个工程师绝对是所有的这个呃团队当中投入最大的。呃，同时呢，我们在很多一些其他一些地方做了大量的一些工作。呃，大家都会知道，是说区块链它天然有两个技术的难点需要去解决。第一个是它的性能，因为它的这个多方的共识会导致性能下降啊，所以这部分我们大量大量的工作啊，也得到了很多一些阿里云的一些支持。那第二部分呢是区块链的安全性，所以我们在这个隐私、在加密等等这方面做了大量的一些工作。所以目前来看，我们的这方面的这个能力还是非常呃非常不错的。呃，这样也是得到了很多我们 global 的一些这个组织啊，包括 g a r d e n e r IDC， 特别是 IDC 其实是二零一九年刚刚这个呃，其实其实这个数据已经老了，呃 ，IDC 在二零二零年的年底刚刚发布了一个新的一个 report， 啊、呃，我们在至少中国的 market share 上面是是遥遥遥遥领先的。我们来讲一下这个 case study， 我相信这也是大家比较感兴趣的。嗯，给大家提一些简单的一些例子，待会我会有些更详细的一些这个介绍。我们在这样一些不同的大的 scenario 里面去做了一些尝试，包括这个产品的这个这个监管和溯源。大家知道这个 COVID-19 啊，这个这个这个新冠疫情其实就是从 cold chain 上面出问题的。所以目前我们是和大量的一些企业和一些政府合作来做这个 cold chain 这个冷链的这个溯源。啊，这个就是一个非常典型的例子。那除了之外，我们和大量的一些商品啊、货品啊进行溯源。大家也知道，阿里巴巴其实最是一个中国最大的一个 B to C 的这个 marketplace。我们本来就是有天然的这个 e-commerce 的这个 DNA， 所以这个上面我做了大量的一些合作。另外一部分呢，我做了这个数字版权的这个保护，待会我会详细讲。And also, we have the protection of data copyrights, supply chain finance, and data asset sharing.、Uh, that's what we have been working on.、Uh, we have also contributed to the charity trading financing using blockchain technology, and we have created many scenario based on blockchain technology. Here are several simple examples. The first one is about supply chain finance solution.、Uh, maybe you are quite familiar with this scenario. It's not difficult to understand. For the、uh, supply chain finance, we need、uh, multi players to participate in it, like the buyer enterprise, a、uh, first level supplier. We all need to work with these parties. Uh, but for the like the buyer enterprises, they have several tiers of pliers, and if、uh, the supplier at one tier faces certain problems,、uh, normally the supplier will go to the bank for financial services. But for us,、uh, we can work with financial institutions like banks. Uh, we can provide the credit to all layers of suppliers, and that is the credit of the buyer. Which means,、uh, like the 
procurement order or other contract of this business activity can be uh, part of the proof uh, for us to apply for the credit from the bank. China has done a lot in protecting digital copyright, but we are not seeing very satisfying results. The reason of this is because when we are protecting digital copyrights, the violation of rights has very low cost, which means a violation of copyright doesn't involve a lot of costs because the litigation process takes very long time and it's very hard to sue them. So in our solution, what we do is that we base the process on blockchain technology so that when the content is put online, there is a identifier. And then we also integrate this platform with the platforms of the government and the businesses. So when there is a violation, we will show this fingerprint on our blockchain and we'll present that to the court. And then the Chinese courts have already uh, recognized such fingerprints so that the, all the cost for me to sue a violator is 500 bucks. And that could greatly enhance copyright production, uh, protection. And also the press, the author, the content and the platform could, the content platform can share the profits. Therefore, even better protecting digital copyrights. So in this way, we could better help the authors. And also we could make sure that there won't be so much a violation of the law in the future. So this is some user examples of protecting digital copyright. So the technology that we use includes cloud computing and AI recognizing whether or not this is a violation. And also we need encryption, we need privacy, and we need to compare a lot of materials. So at Antion, we integrate all sorts of technologies, including blockchain and traceability. We have 2 million products that we sell on our platform at Alibaba. For example, the um, milk powder that Chinese mothers buy for their babies and they purchase them overseas to make sure that the products are authentic. But we need to trace whether or not these products are authentic. So what we do is that we use traceability solution based on blockchain. And also for code chain products, all products that is um, transferred through code chains are now 100% traced by our solution. Salmon or code fish or anything that you buy is based on blockchain which means they're all traceable. So this is an example. This is our code chain platform. And this platform is connected to Alipay. We have 200 million users per day. And then if you scan the QR code, you will find out the traceability of let's say in this example tea tea leaves and then you will see where this tea is from and how it's transported so it's from farm uh, to the table you will see every step of the way um. another example uh, is milk powder the milk powder example 
as I said before. So this is the uh, technical side, of course. So using this technology, we can make sure that the milk powder is authentic. And this is a, a user example in the medical field. In China, when you go to a doctor, when you go to the hospital, you will receive a invoice and then you need to go to the bank or the government to get the uh, endorsement so that you will get your money back. So what we do is that we have a pilot program in Shaoxing City, Zhejiang province. So we use the blockchain technology so that the consumers could get their money back uh, within 37 minutes. So thanks to blockchain technology, we could connect the hospitals, the insurance company and the regulatory authorities, as well as the pharmaceuticals and then we'll connect it all the uh, parties involved. And this is trustful, trust made simple. So what is trustful about? This is a international trade and finance service. So if you are a buyer, let's say you're in Mexico or Singapore or any part of the world, then you will have to go through a lot of uh, different partners. You need to find a supplier and you need to go to the marketplace and you will also need to talk to the buyer bank, the supplier bank, and then you need to go through the tax services and logistics and also you have to go through customs. And that is really problematic. But what we can do now is that we connect through our platform so that the buyer could have access to all the parties involved. And we provide that all on blockchain. So when you have orders, it's on the blockchain, it's on the chain, and also payment, finance, that won't be a problem anymore. And you have logistics. So, it's real-time payment. When it's at the Chinese custom, it's 30% payment. And when it's at the uh, storage, it's 30%. And the uh, last uh, payment, everything is connected. If I'm a supplier, then I don't have to wait. And since I have the credit, so I will get the financing from the supplier bank instantly, making everything so much more efficient. And this is already online. And we will have even more customers moving ahead. This is a B2B version Alipay. And we believe that this program is really, uh, this project is really hopeful. And a lot of um, customers are now working with us, including banks and the uh, merchants holding companies. So to sum it up, at Amchain, what we are doing is that we are building an ecosystem. We connect companies, large and small, and we use both artificial intelligence and IOT, and we connect all the stakeholders involved. It's an ecosystem indeed. And also the platform is open. So we welcome all partners to get involved. As we said before, we have training and uh, uh, so in the previous presenters, they said something about training. And I believe there is a lot of room for us for for their cooperation. And we also hold online platform, the online meetings to discuss future developments. And we look forward to our cooperation with companies like Hyperledger. So that is all about my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Jiang, for the uh, comprehensive introduction of Anchin. 
Well, Anchen is one of the leading blockchain companies in China, and we can see from the presentation that uh, Anchen has more than 50 uh, scenarios and has a great number of uh, blockchain use cases, both in China and the other countries. It's really amazing. And uh, I totally agree with uh, the idea that blockchain plus is very important. And, and personally, I'm curious about the challenges that you have faced when doing blockchain business abroad. So uh, I will look forward to hearing uh, your perceptions in the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that is all uh, for the keynote uh, part. So uh, great thanks to all the five speakers uh, for your wonderful presentations. Uh, now I will pass the role to Tracy from uh, CTC for the panel discussion. Uh, Tracy, are you there? Yeah, hello everyone. This is Tracy yeah. from Cointech of China. Tracy, please, I will share the screen for you. Sure, thank you. Tracy, please, uh, can sure. you see my screen? Sure, yeah. sure. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Xiaoyu, for having me. Hey, everyone, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, no matter where you are. This is Tracy from Cointech of China. And great pleasure to be here as uh, this panel's uh, host. And thanks for our guest time as well. Looking forward to the discussion. Okay, so uh, as some of panelists already had their keynotes, for example, Julian from Hyperledger, Charles from Consensus, and Alex from Ledger Domain, and Jen Zhang from Antchain. So for those who didn't uh, have the keynotes, please let's start with a short intro of who you are and uh, what your company is doing in blockchain sector. So let's start from uh, uh, Ruth Chen uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Guo, and also then following is uh, uh, Kaleido from uh, Mr. Zhao. So, yeah, we'd like to hear um, for the intro. Hi, Tracy. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, all right, I'm going to speak in Chinese. Uh, Hello, everyone. I'm Guo Jianan. I'm from Ruth Chen, and we are a startup. So, what we do is blockchain plus IoT. As we said before about how we integrate both off-chain and on-chain. So what we do is industrial IoT. For me, I've been working in the open source platform for a very long time. And um, I'm also a member at uh, the uh, Hyper, uh, Hyperledger. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Zhao? Right. From yeah. Thank you for the invitation. My name is Zhao Guang. I'm uh, with Clido, and I'm uh, the manager of Asian Pacific Clido. Before Clido, I was in consensus, and I was also in charge of Asian Pacific businesses. And I also worked in other companies before, and uh, we've cooperated with a lot of Chinese companies. Actually, I was the first CEO in the overseas affairs for hire, a Chinese company. And before 2013, I was working in the US government for 19 years. And I also worked in the universities teaching information technology. So my company is supported by people from IBM and Ethem. This new company, this startup company, uh, Ethereum, our friend, and the Hyperledger, we we have a full stack blockchain technology. Clido is the first company who provide consortium as a service, and we are also the first provider of managed blockchain service. And we provide services to companies, to corporates, and we cooperate with EWS. We have an integration with them global wide, and we have a lot of programs global wide. We have integration with data centers. And for Clido, we are probably the only company that has a I I saw two thousand seven a standard a certify certification. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you very much for uh, our guest today. Uh, so let's start. So, you know, while China bans cryptocurrency exchanges and initial coin offering, so the government is set to leverage the underpinning technology, uh, often without a decentralized part. Like blockchain, for instance, could help track the shipment of luxury goods at just the end mentioned, and also authenticate the core evidence, as uh, a previous speaker also mentioned. So in the process of adopting blockchain application in its own interest, China also wants to become a world leader of the, this new technology. So last year, an ambitious government backed the blockchain infrastructure network launching in China, as you guys also heard about that. So the blockchain-based service network also ensures the BSN acts an opening system for blockchain programs. So developers want to have to design a framework from the ground up. So importantly, it's part of the country's goal to set industrial standards and build the underlying infrastructure for blockchain application worldwide. But how does China's blockchain industry integrated with the international community and also so what kind of opportunities or challenges china blockchain industry is facing right now so i really would like to hear your voices uh, uh, from our domestic projects and also have a larger and consensus from overseas so let's start from uh, julian and then we're following the the, the uh, same turn as it's a panelist here hey julian Hi, yeah, thank you. Uh, great question. Uh, I think there are enormous opportunities and challenges um, uh -huh. for, uh, for China's blockchain uh, to in integrate. Also, ultimately, some of the challenges that we, uh, that we uh, face are global, mm -hmm. such as the $1.5 trillion trade finance gap uh, and all the challenges we have with, uh, with, uh, with, with trade finance and uh, communicating globally and identity. Um, I see mm -hmm. that in the supply chain as well. So uh, I think it's important to integrate in terms of technology. We're helping uh, integrate globally. So we all have a standard common um, uh, software basis. And we see a number of those different uh, uh, bases today. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, communicate, 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 right? So, uh, <laughs> and uh, we hope to be part of that and uh, just grow the ecosystem. And uh, I think China is already very much integrated. Uh, but the more integrated we are, the better. It's the network effect, right? The more we're connected, mm. the more we can be together. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Charles, I'd uh, like to hear your thoughts on this. Well, thank you very much. I think when we, when we look at the globalization of businesses and, and enterprises, there is a, a lot of uh, different systems and technology which are being experimented by many different players. And mm -hmm. I think it's very important not to fall in love with uh, uh, with with your technology stack or, or, or your your blockchain kind of architecture, but kind of mm -hmm. reverse engineer uh, from the enterprise needs. And uh, as Julian was saying, uh, what we see is businesses really looking at uh, uh, at uh, reaching out to uh, platforms and the business communities which already have a network effect. And that's mm -hmm. why it's very important in the architecture of any design, should it be a, a global design or a Chinese design, to think how will this fit uh, with, uh, with counterparts at the other side of the world? How can they be onboarded and, and offboarded? Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing we, we also feel very strongly on the market right now is a, a, a kind of a, the early days of a migration from permission blockchain uh, to mm -hmm. kind of more inclusive type of architecture. Should they be mm -hmm. public or semi-public uh, blockchains? And the, uh, what the industries are actually uh, coming to realize right now is uh, if you build a permission blockchain, essentially you are building an intranet. Um, and uh, this, uh, this chain is as rich as how many members you have. And the problem is uh, <clears throat> designing this kind of permission blockchain is, uh, is, uh, is fairly easy. Uh, bringing early members is also something usually people are, are able to achieve, but building a network effect on a closed environment is actually very complicated. Uh, so the business attraction is not always easy to, 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 to work. And this might work in China where the market is extremely uh, massive and uh, there is some key uh, players which, can, which have their existing ecosystem so they can bring permission chain uh, to a certain level of activity where, where the, the business makes sense. But when you look at expanding, um, it's actually a, a very complicated pitch 
uh, to go and convince every new member of your permission chain uh, to get mm -hmm. a special connectivity into your chain. So there is this, um, I think, this phase of realization. Uh, and what we see is a trend which is very similar to the internet uh, in the early days. Uh, if you think of the internet back in the 90s, um, the internet was essentially a patchwork of intranets. Uh, so there was a lot of private mm -hmm. networks and eventually all these private networks came to, to connect uh, one to another and, um, and, and TCP IP came in and there was this kind of global network for everyone to start and, uh, and connect. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I believe as the world of blockchain is, uh, is going through a very similar path where it starts with, uh, with permission chain uh, because it's, uh, it's easier, it's, uh, it's also uh, uh, simpler to, to sell internally within organization but this permission and, and kind of silo architecture mm -hmm. uh, is slowly moving to a, a much more inclusive and, and global type of architecture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, like the Hyperledger and the KSS have been doing a great job as a bridge between West and the East. And uh, so you guys are definitely, they, they saw us are really uh, appreciated here. I mean, very important to uh, source to, to consider. So um, also like, uh, let's go to Jet from Anchain. So, 谢谢Tracy啊,我用中文讲了。Thank uh, you, Tracy. Now I'm going to speak in Chinese. I have the following points to make. The first one is about the trade finance and the tracing of products beyond borders. This is a point where China can be connected to the world. And uh, we have already done similar work in the past. Now we are using the blockchain to work on this field. Uh, we hope we can lower the cost. Mm -hmm. uh, the second point is that uh, for many Chinese companies, they have many kinds of assets. And mm -hmm. many Chinese companies are investing, they are uh, building uh, spots in uh, places like Hong Kong and countries like Singapore. Mm -hmm. Uh, so a uh, blockchain can play an important role in it. You know, some companies are thinking that maybe they can uh, digitize their assets and invest in a uh, Hong Kong market. Uh, this mm -hmm. is a trend we can uh, pay attention to. And this can also help companies to lower their expense. Uh, the next point is uh, what Charles just said. Uh, he said that we need to build an international alliance uh, uh, this is very crucial for us because for many mm -hmm. Chinese companies, our uh, suppliers, they are overseas. So building an international business network is very crucial for us. And we need to think of a way to use blockchain technology to attract overseas players. Mm -hmm. uh, in China, we have already been working on the blockchain system. And now we need to think about how to work with the overseas suppliers to make full use of the blockchain technology. Exactly. And that's yeah. what we haven't tried in the past. Mm. And we are now working on it. The next point is that uh, now the blockchain technology is uh, closely related to uh, things like token and stable mm -hmm. currency. <laughs> and for yeah, okay. these industries, uh, they are not so well spread in China, but they are uh, much more popular in international uh, community. Mm -hmm. So should we try to touch these areas uh, in a more in-depth way in China? Mm -hmm. We also face uh, challenges because for many Chinese enterprises, they are state-owned enterprises. So they mm -hmm. may face the restriction from regulators yeah, yeah. Uh, for Anchain, we also have similar financial and regulatory issues. That's the challenges we face right now. And mm -hmm. that's what I would like to share. Yeah, thanks. I mean, um, geographically, uh, regulators, uh, you know, like when we talk about blockchain, mm -hmm. always we cannot avoid this topic, right? Mm -hmm. Regulation always there. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. long way to go. So also from um, Alex and from Ledger Domain, we'd like to have your insights. Uh, yeah, so again, in the in the world of healthcare, where I'm from, uh, mm -hmm. a single regulatory regime is actually uh, you know can sometimes be a net positive in terms of mm -hmm. getting a highly regulated trading community uh, mm -hmm. all aligned and moving in the same direction. Uh, much of our work would have been 
uh, if not impossible, at least very difficult, were there not mm -hmm. uh, in existing requirements and data models uh, in place that we could leverage. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the opportunities for China, you know, looking at the broader technology picture, the history of China over the last uh -huh. 20 years has really been um, as a, this massive incubator for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, wildly successful products that succeed within the Chinese market before exploding out onto the global stage. Mm -hmm. um, I th my sense is that um, in the global context, uh, blockchain efforts can generally be, be divided into, you know, use case based efforts versus platform based mm -hmm. efforts. And mm -hmm. the use case based efforts do tend to be at least in the healthcare field, the ones that uh, gain the most momentum, uh, because mm -hmm. they are, you know, if you're if you go platform first, you tend to sort of spread somewhat thinner. If you're use case first, uh, you can uh, drive forward a lot more rapidly. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Uh, it, that uh, does offer you the opportunity to be able to loop in overseas partners, um, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, downstream customers or whether it's trading partners, uh, mm -hmm. particularly uh, where a lot of those may be, uh, you know, U.S. or European. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if a global corporation will very much um, focus on use case driven perspectives, right? So it's just generated them more value as we can. Yeah. So from Mr. Guo, uh, from, um, yeah, uh, um, team. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 我觉得首先是从上到下的一个approach. Uh, the first point I'd like to make is that we should take a up to down approach. We can build uh, many scenarios. For example, we can help uh, the Chinese companies to go abroad, uh, like uh, the uh, across the border payment and across the border financing. We have to have an open mind to design the uh, business model. We all know that the algorithm, the functions of the machine is easy to be built, but the algorithm for people to people exchange is very difficult for us to build. We have to work hand in hand. And that is uh, the uh, up to uh, up to down kind of approach. Another uh, approach is uh, from the uh, downstream to the upper stream. That is, uh, we can work from the aspect of the uh, open source community. According to the research, China is now the third largest uh, base for the user of the, uh, of the programmers. So for the developers in uh, China, uh, we can take part actively in the open source activities in the world. I know that there are some uh, gorgeous developers in China. They are very good, but they just uh, don't have the access to take part in the international activities, maybe due to their workload, heavy workload. Uh, in China, we have companies like Alibaba and Huawei. They have been working actively in the field of blockchain technology and open source community. So this can be a very good opportunity for us, and it can be a bridge for China to embrace the world. Uh, yes, I agree that we need to encourage more developers to take part in the uh, uh, global activities and uh, to provide the opportunity for the Western developers to see the uh, capabilities of Chinese developers. Uh, now let's welcome Mr. Zhao. I would like to uh, thank, uh, I would like to answer the question of opportunity and challenge from the following aspects. The first aspect is about the, the leadership, global leadership of China. Another aspect is the uh, maturity of our product. So about uh, uh, China's global leadership, uh, recently Cladel and our team, we have have in-depth communication with uh, SOEs and other players in the industry. Uh, my first thought is that for some SOEs and for some government uh, bodies, they are uh, still at the position in which they are trying to uh, understand uh, they are becoming the global leader. They are trying to accept this reality. Uh, the trend is that 
the picture is more and more clear for them. They are now adapting to the reality that they are becoming the global leader. So this is uh, good news for us. And from the perspective of the business trend, the product development trend, we all know that uh, due to the development of uh, internet and uh, due to other issues, uh, the community is a little bit shrinked. It is a very small community and uh, we are uh, technology based. Uh, so we cannot use the thinking pattern right now to solve the problem of the future. So that is not working. So we have to change our thinking Chinese pattern. For Chinese data enterprises and private companies to have a global perspective and also a local perspective, and they need to know that they will play a global leading role. They have to adapt to that. and high quantity low frequency transaction with its parts uh, with its partners is a scenario that will be used a lot and finance is a very promising sector supply chain mnc cross-border supply chain are promising fields of future development because of silo division man side or maybe because of a duplication of products in china when it comes to cross-border transaction and businesses don't have a lot of businesses doing that and i think there is a great potential there are only a few players now in china are focusing on the international market like ant group so i think if we build an international infrastructure and if we incubate level two and level layer two or layer three businesses, that will be very promising. Another thing that, as I said before, Clido has a ISO certification, which means that when the government and state-owned enterprises need us to provide services, we could manage the data according to international standards. We not only have the technical expertise, but we also are compatible in terms of regulations and standards. Of course, there are many Chinese companies that are applying for those international standards. As for products, there are all sorts of products. When I was working for another company, we began to learn different kinds of technologies such as blockchain, AI, and cloud computing. But there will be a cycle for a technology to develop. When it comes to blockchain, I think there are about 20 interlocking technologies to support this system, but the most mature technology that is a background blockchain and for tokenization DID smart contract and blockchain platforms these four are not mature enough and there are problems that need to be solved but I think in the future they need to further back up the industrial development I think DLT, wallet, and DID are very important. When they are combined, then about 70 to 80% of ID companies, uh, that combination will provide a lot of solutions. For Chinese companies, they are in a dilemma. On the one hand, they want to showcase their capabilities then they want to do smart contracts but when it comes to the profits they are not really sure whether or not these new technologies will help them so there are a lot of things that happens like this and uh, we need to make sure whether we should be profit oriented or technology oriented when it comes to ISN blockchain value 
uh, 3.0. This is something that people talk a lot, uh, talk, talk, talk about a lot. Uh, and uh, for that 3.0, a lot of people are quite idealistic. They want to put everything on the chain. But the problem is when you develop these things further, you need to create value, you need to create a profits. Because uh, when you operate the data, when you manage the data, if you are a solution provider, you need to understand what these technologies are and you need to avoid the risks. So that is the core problem here. I think for uh, state-owned enterprises and for private enterprises in China, if they could focus on production, then things will be so much better. I think they shouldn't focus on something that will only happen in five to 10 years. For example, tokenization, a smart contract, these high frequency and low value transactions, we want to attract investment, so we talk about them a lot, but uh, we need to take heed in these respects. So let, let, yeah, let's go to the our, uh, next question. So uh, I'd like to have a, um, your answers on those. Uh, you know, in China, we put more focus on consortium blockchain development, while for other countries, the consortium blockchain and public chain develop in parallel. So what are your thoughts about it? And what are your insights about the future of the public chain and the consortium blockchain development I mean, globally in this whole map? So uh, I would like to start with Charles, uh, no, so with um, uh, Julian first. So Julian, hey. Okay, I realize we're short of time. So I'll just say <laughs> sure. that I think that we, we have code bases in both, right? So uh, mm -hmm. we're kind of control, but I think there will be a future where you will have a spectrum of based on i think alex said based on on use cases right let's uh, mm -hmm. yeah. right so i think there will be a, a world where you have uh, from permission to permissionless and of course we're going to have interoperability mm -hmm. as well between permission blockchain so we're going to have an interesting future and there's a lot of innovation uh, i think mm -hmm. uh, we can maybe change uh, you know how we look at this as well right um but mm -hmm. I, I see i see a future of, of many different uh, options but it's all going to be based uh, on, mm -hmm. on our, i think at the moment, um, it has been, uh, it, it is uh, because of regulatory and also some technical issues. We work more on permission blockchain and I think that's been a, a very successful model and there will, mm -hmm. many times will, will continue to, to increase and grow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And uh, Charles, uh, your thoughts? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I believe we're gonna end up with some kind of hybrid solutions uh, where mm -hmm. we will, uh, everything will sit on a global network and, and, and uh, public blockchains. But within uh -huh. these public blockchains, there will be some kind of pools or pockets where certain uh -huh. rules will apply. Uh, should it be for, the, for compliance, for privacy, or all kinds of things. And the technology mm -hmm. is really helping us building this kind of, uh, of hybrid blockchain. But ultimately, every project wants to uh, get rich to a maximum mm -hmm. number of stakeholders and potential partners. <laughs> so a public... Yeah infrastructure uh, is really so it is really a strong proposition but yet mm -hmm. it should not be uh, uh, it should not be uh, kind of discounting the fact that people will need privacy they will need to operate in certain rules so my answer is uh, we are going for an hybrid solution uh, sitting mm -hmm. on a public infrastructure mm -hmm. thank you very much and the jet from anti thank you uh, i agree it depends on the scenario. Take finance, for example. If I am using SME, then I would probably use a public blockchain, such as Alibaba. When we are doing small amount uh, loans, that would need to be based on the um, credit of the company. But if we are doing automotive, then we need to see the OEM, we need to see what they want. So of course, in that scenario, we'll need consortium because 
supply chain is the most important infrastructure, so that won't be using the public blockchain. But if you are doing a finance uh, or ABS, then of course there will be a construction and which is connected to a public chain. So it is all, uh, it all depends on these scenarios. For example, there are some pure public uh, blockchain without any consortium. So we also need to take into consideration regulations. Thank you. Yeah, I'll echo what everybody else is saying as far as mm -hmm. um, the need for hybrid solutions and the fact that it's going to be use case variant uh, in many of mm -hmm. these uh, regulated uh, scenarios. Uh, opening up to the public would actually uh, cut counter to a lot of the goals of the regulations to begin with. Uh, whereas if you're mm -hmm. looking like at something like managing patient data, of course, that uh, mm -hmm. that sort of shifts the, uh, the calculus a little bit. Uh, I would also just add that um, as we look at these, uh, you know, types of stacked multiple or interoperating systems, the need for uh, decentralized identifiers um, mm -hmm. and the ability to make claims on uh, different blockchains uh, is going to be uh, increasingly important. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Yeah. And uh, uh, Guo Zhong, in, in your hey, um, I think there are two so I think there are two layers to it. Uh, from the uh, basic technology, of course, China focus uh, pay great attention to public blockchain, and there are a lot of people focusing on blockchain, uh, public blockchain. But because of regulation, and because of the scenarios, there will be some limits setting to it. So I think there will be a integration. When we look at it from a perspective of spectrum, there will be permission on one extreme and permissionless on the other extreme. Then I think based on different scenarios, we should move along this spectrum and there will be a combination of both. When it comes to infrastructure, infrastructure will be uh, opened not only to the public, but also to different specific groups. So we need to take consideration both. Mr. Zhao. Thank you, Dorothy. Well, for me, I think when we provide solutions for companies, for the net, or we don't have any specific use cases, but when we are talking with our clients, they have specific requirements and we are listening So what we do is that mostly we use permission-based and we are value-oriented. But it all depends on the pace of technology development and it all depends on uh, iteration. So one day, I think there will be a combination based on scenarios. So the public chain and the consortium chain, I think for quite some some time into the future, there will be a combination of both. Um, so, uh, thank you for, for your uh, insights. I'll be back with you here. Mm. And uh, um, so, special thanks to our partner, ABI, Zhongguo Tong Chi Kuai Lian, Chai Ye Lian Mang, and the CAICT, Zhongguo Tong Xin Yue. Uh, so, this is uh, a really thank you nice for our organizers. Fast and uh, I will move the floor to Xiaoyu from CAICT again for some conclusion. Welcome, Xiaoyu. Uh, thank you, thank you, Tracy, and uh, thank all the panelists today, and uh, thank you very much. And also, thank you, uh, thank all, all the audiences for your uh, attentions. Uh, I hope this webinar uh, is uh, fruitful for you. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, if you are interested in China blockchain industry, and our uh, series of webinar, uh, Blockchain Connecting to the World. Please follow the seminar and feel free uh, to, um, I'm sorry, I will change the slides. Yeah, uh, feel free to mm -hmm. contact me through the yeah. email, which is on the screen. So it's uh, at mm -hmm. the bottom. Uh, uh, my 
full, uh, full name, Yu Xiaoyu, uh, at cst.ac.com. Uh, and uh, I will also give you um, uh, information about the BIF project uh, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, also, uh, we can add you to our uh, mailing list of uh, ABI, and we will send you news and uh, event notices regularly about China's blockchain industry. Well, last but not least, the International Working Group of ABI welcomes all of you to join. And also, please uh, follow our partners, Hyperledger and uh, Coin Cointelegraph China. And uh, thank you very much. I think the webinar is adjourned. Thank you.